Audio check, testing one, two, looking at the camera or looking at yeah. my... Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Good afternoon, and welcome to our first live virtual town hall event. I'm Amy Ventitulo. This town hall event has really been designed for you, our community. Our goal is to ensure that we're answering your top COVID-19 questions. Today's topic specifically regarding healthcare response. With me today is a panel of experts from our region and local elected officials here to address you directly. So before we jump into our questions, let's first hear from our local elected leaders. Joining me via Zoom is our City of Reno Mayor Hillary Sheedy, our City of Sparks Mayor Ron Smith, and our Washoe County Commission Chair Bob Lucy. First, let's hear a few words from Mayor Hillary Sheedy. Welcome, Mayor. All right. Thank you so very much. And thank you to our regional partners for having this important community conversation. Um, I'm really grateful to be here and to invite our community into really finding out um, more information about what this crisis entails. I also want to thank our entire community for doing a tremendous job right now with social distancing and staying home for Nevada. It's incredibly important right now that we flatten the curve and we know that we are doing a tremendous job. So I want to thank everyone in our community for doing such. And again, let's spread kindness, not the virus. Thank you, Mayor Sheevy. Now we want to hear from City of Sparks Mayor Ron Smith. Welcome, Mayor Smith. Hi, how are you? I'm well. How are you, sir? I'm doing well, thank you. It, it, I am uh, Sparks Mayor Ron Smith. Thank you very much for including me in this town hall. This is such a great way to answer some very important questions. These are trying times and very difficult on all of us but please remember that we are all in this together. My thoughts and prayers go out to the families that have lost loved ones and to those that are battling this disease now. Many of us think there is nothing we can do and feel helpless, but there is something we can all do and that is stay home for Nevada. And there's something else we can do as well. Due to the COVID-19 pandemic, suicides across the nation are on the rise. We are challenging all community members, city and county leaders, organizations, businesses, and agencies to be part of the solution to prevent suicide by taking some important 25-minute training called SAVE, S-A-V-E. This training is offered through the Department of Veterans Services and Psych Armor. It will help us all recognize the signs and help someone that may be contemplating taking their own life. Please go to psycharmor.org to take this great training. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Smith. Now let's hear from Washoe County Commission Chair Bob Lucy. Welcome. Oh, welcome. Thank you for having me. Appreciate it. You know, I'm proud to be part of this first virtual town hall meeting that we're having today and taking the time to hear from those on the front lines that are fighting COVID-19. In Washoe County, listening to our concerned citizens and, and the questions that they may have during this trying time. I want to thank Mayor Sheeby, Mayor Smith, um, we are all standing side by side with our leaders here and with, along with the health district to address the ever-growing needs of COVID-19 here in Washoe County. This is a very serious issue that we're dealing with and the only way we'll continue to combat that is a, as a unified team. And I think you've seen that through our regional partners and how they've been continually working together to address the current, the current need. Now more, no, uh, now more than ever, you know, as we continue to see the spread of COVID-19 continue to grow here in Northern Nevada, 
people are being beyond inconvenienced, um, not being able to go to the stores and, and whatnot in parks, in, in golf courses. Those are challenges that can be overcome. What can't be overcome is the loss of life. We need to continue. The threat is continuously real and it's going to get worse and before it gets better. So right now, as the mayors have both said, you know, please stay home for Nevada. This is the most important time and trying time. It is the inconvenience, but it is the most, thing, the most important thing that you can do. You know, Washoe County stood up the incident command team to um, address this emergency issue. We have a great leader in our incident commander, Sam Hicks, who is unified with a number of highly trained individuals um, who have worked tirelessly to address this ever-growing concern. And so we want, I want to first thank them and all their time that they put in over the last few weeks to really address all these growing needs that we're seeing. And it really does show that we can work together as a unified and as a community. And I think that's the most important thing that we'll see coming out of this. So I wanna thank everybody for participating today. I'm excited to hear the questions and have you talk with all the individuals that are here joining us. Thank you. And thank you so much to all our of our elected leaders for being with us today. We appreciate it. And now it's time to take your questions. You've been submitting them all week on our website, covid19washoe.com. And we have assembled a panel of experts. With us today, we have Dr. Anderson from Northern Nevada Medical Center, Dr. Hess from St. Mary's Regional Medical Center, Dr. Straczynski from Renown Health, Dr. Fry from the Washoe County Medical Society, Kevin Dick from the Washoe County Health District, and Adam Hines from REMSA. Thank you all so much for your time today. Our first question, how should you treat symptoms if you're not sure you have COVID-19? And I'm gonna ask Dr. Anderson from Northern Nevada Medical to take this first question. Hi there, thank you for having me. Um, as far as treating symptoms of COVID-19, we're recommending that patients treat it just like the common cold. So lots of fluids, Tylenol for fever or body aches, and then monitor for severe or worsening symptoms such as shortness of breath, persistent chest pain, um, any symptoms you can't control at home. And if you are feeling very unwell and you're not controlling your symptoms, contact your primary care doctor. And if you are feeling really unwell and need to be seen immediately, get a ride to the emergency department or call 911 and get an ambulance to come get seen. And, and speaking of calling 911 and an ambulance, kind of a follow-up question for Adam Hines at REMSA, when do symptoms become an emergency? Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, good, okay. Uh, thank you for having me. You know, it starts with uh, trouble breathing and this, this infection um, does cause patients to be a little breathless um, but if you're having shortness of breath or you're having trouble breathing, uh, that would be a sign of an emergency, as well as persistent pain or pressure in your chest, any type of new confusion, or any time you are unable to wake somebody. And then something we call cyanosis, which is blue, kind of a bluish color around the lips and face. In addition, it's important for people to know that we're obviously talking about COVID, but there are other medical conditions that continue to uh, be endemic within our community. And that is, is people will continue to have heart attacks and strokes and appendicitis. So those signs and symptoms, it's so very important um, to make sure that you're calling 911 for those things in our community. Thank you, we appreciate the response. Our next question, how does COVID-19 progress in a patient from being in the hospital to being in ICU and then progress to being on a ventilator? And I'm going to ask Dr. Straczynski from Renown Health to address this one for us. Thank you, and thank you for having me. Uh, we have data that was released by the CDC just two days ago that, in general, uh, when looking at about 14 states, about 5% of patients, or about 5 patients out of 100,000 actually get hospitalized. If a patient needs hospitalization, there's a small percentage of those individuals who actually may need to advance to the intensive care unit. And the primary aspect of that has to do with the work of breathing, as you've heard how this virus attacks respiratory status, as well as their ability to oxygenate. If their ability to oxygenate is diminished to the point that they can't be supplemented with other means, they may need to be placed on a ventilator. And that is the primary reason the patients with COVID wind up uh, entering the ICU. The other is that there may be other side effects from this virus, including overwhelming infection from sepsis, or ultimately, as we talked about, or as you may have heard, 
acute respiratory stress syndrome. Thank you, Dr. Shazinski. And I know we've heard some conflicting information about this next question, which is, what is the length of time the virus remains alive on surfaces? And I'm gonna ask Dr. Hess from St. Mary's to help us with this one. Yes, thank you for having me. So unfortunately, this particular virus is fairly hardy um, and so can uh, remain uh, transmissible for quite some time outside of the body. Um, as there's been a few studies on this, the CDC actually has uh, some information posted on this. Uh, the New England Journal of Medicine actually published a study uh, less than a month ago, uh, kind of giving us guidelines. And this is sort of what came out of that. First, um, it's important to know that our food and water do not seem to transmit the virus. So when you're eating or drinking, you do not need to be fearful that what you're ingesting could give you the virus. That being said, what food or liquid are packaged in could potentially uh, carry the virus. And so um, these are some sort of household items that you may have or come in contact with, and this is the length of time that typically um, these things can be infectious. Um, copper, which would be like certain pots and pans, can, uh, the virus can remain viable for up to four hours. Cardboard, which might be like packaging boxes, can remain viable for up to a day. Um, plastic or stainless steel, which is really most of our services, uh, whether it be door handles, light switches, sort of uh, countertops, unfortunately the virus can remain viable for up to two to three days. Um, and that goes back to the social distancing, wearing the masks that are now recommended, so if someone does sneeze or cough, that it doesn't then get on a surface that then somebody else could come along and touch that same uh, surface and then touch their face or mouth. Um, so those are sort of the, the, the main guidelines uh, as far as how long this uh, virus remains viable. Thank you for sharing that and for, and for clearing that up for us. We appreciate it. And kind of a follow-up question to that, how long does it linger in the air? And I'm gonna ask Dr. Fry from the Washoe County Medical Society to please answer this one. Thank you. Uh, so the, the physics of transmission are becoming a little bit more clear over time as we get more information. And it's probably important for the, uh, the viewers to appreciate that there is a respiratory droplet, which is a larger particle size that typically is greater than five microns and settles after a cough, uh, for instance, in a room, um, settles pretty easily onto surfaces uh, and doesn't stay aerosolized in the, in the air very long at all. Uh, but there is a bioaerosol that uh, uh, component to this, uh, which puts uh, healthcare providers, especially at risk when they're doing aerosolizing procedures. And these bioaerosols uh, could also be um, in play with with normal speech. Uh, for instance, uh, the louder somebody speaks, or if they have different um, speech mechanics than uh, the next person, they can actually have these bioaerosols. Um, go into the air and, and we, we believe that this could be helping transmission um, out in public and that's why it's so important uh, for everybody to wear some sort of mask uh, when they're out in proximity to others. Exactly, thank you so much, Dr. Fry. And our next question that we've been getting a lot of questions on is where do I go to get tested? Mr. Kevin Dick, Washer County Health District, can you answer this for us? Yes. Uh, Thank you, uh, Amy, for having this uh, town hall forum. Appreciate uh, the opportunity to be here. In order to get tested, uh, we're recommending for people to uh, contact their primary care physician um, or uh, contact our uh, hotline at uh, 328-2427. That's area code 775-328-2427. And um, we're uh, only asking people uh, to make those contacts for testing if they have symptoms and are concerned that they have COVID-19. When you call our center, um, we will then uh, ask a, a series of questions uh, about your uh, symptoms and, and about you uh, so that we can uh, determine whether you meet the risk criteria that we're using for uh, the people that we have come to have samples collect collected for testing. Uh, so that will depend on the symptoms that you're exhibiting. Uh, it will depend on what, what types of underlying conditions that you may have, uh, your age, uh, factors that uh, help us identify 
uh, who we believe are the, the vulnerable population uh, that we need to prioritize for those tests. Uh, we'll also be prioritizing healthcare workers and first responders uh, for that testing. Then if you are um, scheduled for, for testing, uh, we'll provide you with the time and the location to come uh, through our drive-through test location. If you're working with your uh, healthcare provider, um, they can work with you to arrange for uh, testing through your healthcare system. Um, if you're having difficulty um, uh, working with them for that, uh, you might want to contact an urgent care facility that's associated uh, with your uh, healthcare, um, health insurance and healthcare provider uh, to be able to talk with them about opportunities for testing. Uh, because uh, test samples are also being collected and, uh, and submitted for testing uh, through our healthcare systems. So that's uh, how you would uh, make arrangements for testing and you'd be directed uh, as to where to go and when uh, to have that sample collected. Thank you so much, Kevin, for explaining that process for us. We appreciate it. And our next question is really for our hospital partners. And that question is, do we have enough space in our hospitals and will we reach or exceed capacity in the coming weeks? And first, I'm going to ask Dr. Straczynski from Renown to answer, followed by Dr. Anderson, Northern Nevada Medical, followed by Dr. Hess St. Mary's. Well, thank you for the question. I think the first thing to say is that we are prepared. Uh, if, if you look uh, anywhere in our um, news and media, hospitals, not only in our county, but around the country are preparing for a potential surge. And I think that's where we need to focus. The key with this is that we will stay prepared and remain prepared if we all do our part to make sure that we're following social distancing. That is what impacts uh, the and flattening the curve. Uh, but we have been preparing for weeks uh, in addition with our partners uh, from the county as well as the state. So we are prepared, but we're asking everyone to do their part uh, so that we can uh, help save lives. Thank you. Dr. Anderson. I totally agree with those statements. Uh, Northern Nevada Medical Center, as well as Renown, St. Mary's, and all the other partners in the region have coordinated almost daily ab about their efforts. Um, all of our hospitals have initiated tents to uh, accommodate increased volume and to protect patients and staff members, both inside the hospital and out. Uh, our hospital, uh, just like the other hospitals in town, have dramatically increased their ability uh, to see patients and the capacity. Um, I think we're all fearful of the amount of patients that will come through, but fortunately we've had enough time to adequately prepare. And I feel like our hospital partners across the region will uh, do a good job at taking care of our patients. Absolutely, thank you. Dr. Hess. I'd just like to reiterate what my two colleagues have both touched on. Um, I think there's been a community-wide effort uh, to make sure that we are uh, prepared for a potential surge um, and uh, we've all increased capacity. I do also wanna point out that I think all the hospitals have created uh, uh, significant restrictions within the hospital to prevent any type of spread within the hospital. Uh, one of my colleagues touched on earlier about, you know, there's still people out in the community having heart attacks and strokes. And one of the great fears we have right now is that those patients are not seeking care because they're afraid to go into the hospital. Please do not be afraid to go into the hospital. The hospitals have taken great precautions to avoid transmission of the virus uh, within the hospital setting. So um, please do seek care if you have those other uh, issues. Um, and uh, uh, like I said, I think we're very well prepared for a potential surge. All the hospitals have, have significantly increased capacity. Thank you, appreciate it. And our next question kind of on the heels of that, what are other ways we can keep people out of hospitals? Adam Hines with REMSA, would you take that one for us? You know, it starts with, with prevention, um, doing everything that uh, you, you're hearing, right? So washing your hands, washing them often, doing it at least for 20 seconds, adhering to the social distancing, minimizing any type of gatherings. As our, our great electeds and our healthcare colleagues have said, using masks when you're out in public, um, eating healthy and just getting plenty of rest. Those are uh, obviously the ways in which you try and really minimize the potential for you to get COVID-19. But for those people that um, you know actually do come down with this illness, uh, a lot of it has to do with exactly what we do when we're sick, right? So 
hydrate, get plenty of rest, quarantine yourself, especially uh, if if you are in a in a home with multiple people. Try to reserve or or, or um, put yourself in a room where you can have your own bathroom and, and you're not um, um, gathering together. Um, in addition, using uh, over-the-counter fever reducing medications. And the other thing that we have seen very quickly is telehealth and technology has been something um, that has been coming. And I think uh, this uh, pandemic has really pushed those uh, technological accesses um, to healthcare um, to, to everybody. And so using things like telehealth, it's convenient. It reduces exposure. Not everybody that has these symptoms does have COVID-19. They could have flu. They could have a simple cold. And so it reduces the potential that you may get COVID-19. In addition, it, it reduces the risk of potentially transmitting it to, to that. Now, we know that some people are just not as comfortable with technology or they need to see a physician in person. And so uh, if you're using a primary care or you're using a clinic, uh, one of the things that we're recommending is to ensure that you call ahead. A lot of those places have different procedures on how they will, again, um, construct environmental things to reduce uh, the potential transmission. And so that may be meet, meeting you out at the car, having you come through a different entrance, uh, waiting um, outside until a, a room is available. All those things are, again, to ensure patient safety and decrease risk of transmission. Great. Thank you so much. So our next question, how is it determined that a COVID-19 patient is recovered and can they become infected again? First, I'm gonna ask Dr. Fry with the Washoe County Medical Society to respond, followed by Mr. Kevin Dick, the Washoe County Health District. Thank you. Uh, so we've had to kind of go down a, a non-test-based strategy most of the time with respect to uh, whether somebody's recovered or not from COVID. Uh, and usually uh, recovery is based upon, you know, uh, significant and consistent improvement in symptoms. What the CDC is recommending, and I think everybody should really follow this strictly, is uh, they, they they can consider themselves uh, on, on the road to recovery or mostly recovered when you've had a, a number of things happen. One of them is three days without any fever and no use of any kind of uh, fever reducing agents like Tylenol. And just to reiterate, at this time, we have enough information to probably say that uh, using NSAIDs or, or things like Aleve and Motrin to treat uh, your fever with this illness is probably not a good idea. It could lead to some additional uh, uh, problems. So we'd, we'd ask people to use Tylenol to reduce fever. Uh, second is just an overall improvement of your respiratory symptoms. You know, you're feeling less short of breath, uh, less winded when you do household chores uh, or go on a walk. And then the third thing is uh, that you want to have seven days go by uh, with, uh, you know, no, since your symptoms first appeared. Uh, and, be, and mostly because we believe that viral shedding con continues to go on even when you're uh, symptom free for quite some time. Uh, studies have shown uh, kind of on average maybe three days, but up to as much as uh, a week to 10 days. So uh, if, for those that have recovered, please continue to wash your hands, uh, social distancing, masks over the face, because we just aren't sure about how long viral shedding can truly occur and in our community. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you, Amy. Um, I agree with uh, what Dr. Fry uh, just uh, explained to us for uh, a, a non-test-based strategy for uh, releasing people from isolation uh, as, as far as their recovery goes, uh, the, uh, the three-day period without a fever, uh, but also uh, emphasizes, I believe he was uh, telling us, that significant reduction in other symptoms uh, as well. So not just three days without a fever, but significant improvement of, of their condition and, and reduction in all symptoms. Uh, seven days, uh, at least seven days after initial onset of uh, the, their uh, symptoms. The, uh, we also, there's a test-based strategy um, that's, in, that's included in the guidance that we have from uh, the state and that comes through CDC. Uh, and that is uh, after that uh, uh, three-day uh, period to conduct uh, testing of individuals to have two negative tests occur 
uh, 24 hours uh, separated in that uh, in those sample collection for the, the testing. And we are conducting that testing for some critical uh, uh, workers in our community, uh, being uh, healthcare uh, uh, providers that have uh, been recovered from COVID-19 and uh, first responders uh, before they're ret returning to duty. Uh, but we're, we're having most of our uh, releases uh, occur based on the non-test-based strategy uh, so that we can continue to prioritize uh, the, the testing of uh, vulnerable uh, populations uh, that we have. And then uh, there's um, COVID-19 is a, is a new disease and we're learning more about it every day. Uh, and so we don't know for sure um, what the extent of immunity is that people may have if they've recovered uh, from COVID-19. So the, the, our belief is uh, that there is an immunity that will occur uh, for some period of time that would help to protect them from reinfection, uh, but we don't know what that period of time is, and uh, we would expect that that uh, immunity would wane um, uh, the further out that they are from having recovered from the disease. But that's certainly something that uh, is being studied, and we're hoping to have better information on that in the future. Great, thank you so much, we appreciate it. And we're gonna ask one last question of our entire panel. And that question is, share with us your most asked question you've received so far and your response. And we're gonna start with Dr. Anderson, Northern Nevada Medical. Well, I think um, we've kind of already answered that. We often get asked when to go to the emergency department. You know, we reassure patients that they will probably have mild to moderate symptoms and be okay at home. Um, and then just to reiterate when to come to the emergency department, if there's any signs of confusion, uh, cyanosis, as Adam had said, uh, blue coloring around the lips or distal fingers, um, severe shortness of breath, you can't catch your breath going up the stairs or getting to the bathroom, or persistent and severe chest pain is time to come to the emergency department. Great, and then next is Dr. Hess, St. Mary's. Uh, yeah, so uh, one of the most common questions I get from patients is, you know, how likely is it that I'm gonna get severely ill from this? And, um, you know, fortunately, statistically, um, 80 to 85 percent of people are going to get mild to even no symptoms. That remaining sort of 15 percent um, can get significant illness. And then obviously, 5 percent um, can have a very severe illness that ultimately ends up in the ICU or on a ventilator. That being said, um, I don't want people to be completely uh, afraid either. I mean, I think if we're following the guidelines that have been put out there, we are clearly flattening the curve. Um, the social distancing is making a difference. Um, all these things that we put in place are there for a reason, um, and it is truly saving lives. So um, that's just really what I want to reemphasize. Thank you so much. Dr. Straczynski, Renowned Health. Well, I would say actually the, the most common question that I get is how can we help? And when you think about the, uh, the aspect of our heroic people on the front lines, the first thing is really what you've heard over and over again from everyone in this panel, which is do your part for social distancing, do your part for respiratory etiquette, do your part for appropriate cleaning and disinfection. I think that's, that's one of the key things. When it comes to helping out our, our frontline teams, uh, every institution and the county and others have ways for you to, to donate, to, to look at things, whether it's PPE um, or other aspects. Um, that's primarily it. It's how do people help. And the first is to uh, abide by the social distancing rules so we can get through this as quickly as possible. Uh, and then uh, follow processes that we have within the various institutions in the county uh, to see how you can help safely and appropriately. Great, thank you. Dr. Fry, Washoe County Medical Society. Thank you. Uh, so I would say that uh, you know we're we're seeing a tectonic shift really uh, in in how quickly uh, we can all adapt uh, and overcome. We've seen you know just uh, uh, people quickly uh, going to uh, you know uh, uh, avoiding permissive attitudes, uh, which allows further silent spread, which I think is just unbelievable. We have cell phone data to back that up that says people are moving around a lot less and doing their part. Uh, I think that we have opportunity to do more and 
I would just say that the economics of this are, are also very important to, uh, to speak to because uh, if we look 100 years ago at the 1918 pandemic, the communities that did this well uh, and early and, and for an appropriate duration did a lot better economically. And so for folks that are out there hurting economically, uh, doing their part and continuing to follow these measures is going to help you um, even in the short run as we as we come out of this. Thank you so much. Mr. Kevin Dick, Washer County Health District. Thank you, Amy. Um, I think one of the questions I get a lot is about the, the various models that are out there and when we're going to hit our peak uh, for, for this disease in, in the community. And so there's wide variation in what's being projected on those models from uh, we're at our peak now to we're not going to be at our peak until the end of May. And I guess I would um, circle that back around to what uh, everybody's been talking about is uh, our how we can affect that peak is through our social distancing practices. Um, because if we can flatten that curve, uh, that is gonna change where the peak is, how high it is, and, and when it is. And we need to continue to do everything we can uh, to uh, be staying at home, uh, not going out in, unless it's essential, uh, distancing ourselves when we are out and covering our, our faces with a, a cloth uh, facial covering to prevent us spreading disease and contaminated surfaces, et cetera. Um, I guess I'd follow up with, I also get uh, questions about how are you doing? And I'm sure everybody's getting those kinds of questions because we're under a lot of stress uh, right now and people are uh, staying home. Um, they're, they're not being out and about uh, and that's gonna wear on people over time. And so I think that uh, I would echo uh, some of the message that we heard from Mayor Smith as well as while we're uh, social distancing, we need to make sure that we're taking care of ourselves and, and the people that we know and love and support everybody through this process. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you so much. And next, Mr. Adam Hines, REMSA. We get a lot about is how we're keeping our medics and our patients safe. And you know, it starts off with just as I know everybody on this, this panel, uh, a shout out to our healthcare providers for what they do every day, sacrificing uh, many times, staying over, staying late, picking up additional shifts, uh, going into the kind of the, the, the hot zone uh, where we know patients um, potentially have this virus and it could come onto them and to their family. I think that's so very important. Um, in addition, thanking our community media and great public and healthcare leaders who are um, so, so, so supportive. You know, it starts at REMSA Health with a fit for duty screening. Uh, every paramedic EMT administrator goes through uh, a screening to make sure that they're healthy when they come to work. Um, in addition, uh, you know, uh, as the community uh, dynamics have shifted and, and we know that first responders, police, fire, and medical people, as well as healthcare workers, uh, having access to meals and the community has come together so greatly to be able to provide um, uh, a, a lot of free meals to our people in healthcare, but in addition, um, uh, we have taken uh, on the burden of ensuring that um, we have uh, uh, meals for our, our crews every day so that they can heat up something that's healthy and nutritious. Um, in addition, supporting them when they are sick. A lot of times people feel like there's some sort of punitive nature if they're calling in or they may not have access to PTO2. So we have put things in place to ensure that that's not a worry um, uh, and focusing on their health. When people call in the community, um, they're going to be asked and we ask for their patients because they are asked um, some additional questions. Know that an ambulance is on the way. Uh, from the get-go, right when we get your address, within about 16 seconds, we have a REMSA uh, ambulance responding to you, but they are going to ask questions about your um, symptoms or about people in your home symptoms. Uh, in addition, they may provide you with some instructions, potentially putting on a mask or covering your mouth with a cloth if you can meet the, the paramedics outside. And that really, again, uh, just helps protect our responders and anybody else from coming in contact with something infectious. You know, we wear PPE uh, daily, maybe not to this extent. We're very familiar with 
um, infectious diseases such as TB and bloodborne pathogens and such. This has become kind of the new norm, um, but we've also increased the way in which we decontaminate our ambulances, which take more time. And so uh, that's all stuff that our people are versed in. We had to quickly make sure that they were comfortable with it. And then just to echo the health officer's concern as well as Mayor Smith, uh, you know, after this, and, and quite frankly, right now, um, ensuring that the people in which are, are serving the public, we have to make sure that their mental health is. This is extremely stressful. People are frustrated. They're scared. They may be overwhelmed. And so ensuring that uh, our team members on the healthcare side remain healthy so we can um, help you is, is priority. Great. Thank you so much. We appreciate it. And I'm actually going to ask that same question of our elected officials. What have you been hearing from our citizens? Let's start first with Reno Mayor Hillary Sheavey. All right. Thank you. I would say the number one question that I get is when will this be over? And I think that people need to understand this is going to be a very long road. It's not going to be easy. The other question I get a lot is, you know, I thought we were going into the surge now. And I want people to really understand when we talk about this surge, because we started early, which was a great thing, that it's allowing us to sort of move that those numbers of that surge. And that means that actually what we're doing in the community is working by social distancing and those types of things. The good news is that Reno is incredibly resilient. We are an incredible community. We come together in times of need. You know, there's so many different um, community members out there doing tremendous things. We will get through this, but it is going to be long. It's going to be tough. Um, sometimes you might not like what I always have to say, but I'm certainly going to be honest. And again, I think circling back to mental health, I'm working on um, several mental health initiatives because people are going to need it now more than ever in our community. And we really have to look out for one another and be kind to one another and continue to realize that we are in this together. We will get through this. Um, and I just, you know, I want people to understand that what they are doing right now is really helping our healthcare providers, our, our the, the men and women on our front lines, our heroes, um, help be able to manage this crisis because as we continue to move along, um, we're, have, we're going to have to continue to make sure we're doing everything we can. And that means we don't let up on the gas, right? We have to continue to make sure that we're staying at home for Nevada. We are social distancing. We are wearing masks or face covers. Remember, the N95s need to be safe for our medical providers and our community. So um, I, I just would say, please, you know, hold on and just know we're all scared, but we're also all in this together and we will get through it together. Thank you, Mayor Sheevy. appreciate it. R Mayor Ron Smith, City of Sparks, what are your citizens asking you? You know, a, lo a lot of them are asking me the same questions that they're asking Mayor she uh, Sheevy. Uh, a lot of it is, why can't we go to the parks? Um, why can't we uh, take a walk? Why can't we, why can't we mingle with people? And, you know, I I think the people uh, of this area uh, have come together. Uh, they're they're ch very they're very charitable, and they want to help each other. So uh, I always say, you know, this we're this is strange times we're living in right now. We've never been through anything like this. None of us have uh, at, at the age, and I'm probably the oldest one on the panel. Uh, but you know, it's just um, please stay home for Nevada. Take care of yourself, call your grandma and grandpa, call your mom and dad, call your brother and sister and see how they're doing. Um, it probably means a lot to them because I've got nine grandkids and uh, I can't touch any one of them uh, for, this, for the reasons I'm talking about right now. I mean, this is serious stuff. We want everybody to be safe and we will get through this together. Thank you, Mayor Smith. We appreciate it. Next. Washer County Commission Chair Bob Lucy, what are citizens asking you? You know, it's it changes, and I think uh, we hear at the county hear the same things as they, they do at both of the cities. You know, when are we going to get through this? And but how are we going to recover? What are the steps? What's it going to look like after this is over? And I think those are a lot of the unknowns that are out there right now. But you know, rest assured that the community as a whole, the economy as a whole, will recover. I think Mayor Shevey said it. We're a very resilient community. We have 
the resources available. And I think what, what we need to really be focused on right now is that because this is, this is very uncertain times, because this is so new, because we're still trying to learn so much about what this disease, uh, this pandemic is, that we're doing everything we can to prepare for the worst, but hope for the best. So I think when we do things like that, you're going to see things shut down, things uh, be, your lives be inconvenienced. And there is no goal line, so to speak, that you say, hey, look, we're gonna get there and everything will be back to normal. Because I don't know what the new normal is going to be like. But what I can tell you is that because you have uh, amazing individuals that you've heard from on the panel today, you've got uh, an amazing group of elected officials that are working tirelessly day in and day out. Look, there's nobody on this panel that doesn't understand that this is a number one priority for us and that we're really, really looking for the best solution for everybody. And we wanna make sure that everybody is safe. We wanna make sure that your brothers, your sisters, your family members, your grandparents, your kids, um, your friends, stay healthy and that's the biggest thing i mean we we are working to make sure that everybody stays healthy and i think that in itself um, is why you're seeing massive uh constructions of uh, places like the trailers out of the edison housing project for those individuals that are going to need isolation care if they don't have a place to go you're seeing um the army corps of engineers working with the regional partners to build a uh, an alternative care site in our convention center that will be able to house patients if a surge comes those are the types of things that you're seeing our community do to address this. Then you're seeing issues such as um, regional governments um, waive business license fees and, and penalties for individuals that may not be able to pay those individuals. You're looking at uh, rent and evictions being waived so that people can remain in their house and stay safe and not, not go out and try to look for a new place to live at these uncertain times. You're seeing those types of issues be addressed day in and day out. And, we're meeting continuously to have those discussions to find out what the next steps are. Um, and it's, it's really, um, as you've heard this expression many times um, from our health, our health district officer, it's, we're building the plane as we're flying this thing. And it, it is really a difficult challenge, but we're doing the best we can. And, and it's, it's probably one of those most important questions that we get is, when are we gonna get out this and what that new, what are, when, are, when are we gonna be able to get back to our normal life? And, and realistically, we don't have an answer for you, but what I can tell you is that we are concerned about your normal life. We are concerned about getting you back to that normal life. We are concerned about getting your businesses back open um, and your people back to work and everybody to have uh, some semblance of a, of a normal life again. We don't know when that's going to be, but I promise you we are working tirelessly to make sure that that is a reality soon. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you to our fantastic panel of experts who are with us today. We so appreciate you taking the time to answer questions from our community. That wraps up the Q&A portion of our town hall, but we still have two more guests to join us. Our next guest is someone who knows exactly what it's like to be on the front lines of this healthcare crisis. With us next is Monica Teves, who is the REMSA and EMS supervisor. Monica, thank you for being with us. Thank you for having me. It's uh, it's an honor to be able to participate in this panel. And I'd like to first give a shout out to all of our co-responders, first responders, healthcare workers. This time has showed how tightly bonded we all are. And we're all looking out for each other. We are making sure we're all safe and we are able to keep going in our jobs because we are vital and need to be out there helping. So um, a lot of our protocols haven't necessarily changed, but we do have to ask patience of the people that call for us because it will take more time for us to prep before we can make contact with them. So a lot of times people may run out of the house trying to wave us in quickly if they're concerned about their loved one, but we must ensure that the crews are safe. So they have to be fully covered up and prepared um, to lower their risk so that they can go home to their families. Absolutely, thank you, Monica. And can you give us an overview of what it's been like in your world in the last month? The, the challenges have started out with uh, just staying on top of all the changes, um, the communication, all the knowledge that we're all trying to take in as far as you know what the new day is showing it 
it's a constant challenge and making sure with our 500 employees that we're able to communicate it, make it very clear. We want to keep them safe and that, you know, doing above and beyond the amount of isolation and cleaning of the ambulances is only going to be for the better. And it, it definitely works us all a lot harder. Um, but I think in the long run, it's going to keep us resilient um, as we have been as a county. Absolutely. Absolutely. And if there was one thing you could say to the community, Monica, from your perspective, what would it be? Well, we really appreciate those of you that are staying home um, to keep them out of safe. We do still meet the challenges of there are a lot of people afraid to go to the ER. They may call us to come check them out, um, which is free of charge. And we will go in, we'll assess them, offer them transport or other opportunities to, to tie in with what they need to take care of what's going on. Um, but I really want to stress that when there's the shortness of breath and things are starting to deteriorate, they need to call 911 or go to the emergency room and not wait too long because um, it does progress pretty rapidly if they do have the underlying conditions. Thank you, thank you so much. And thank you to all of our heroes on the front lines battling COVID-19 in our community. We appreciate you. Thank you. And thank you. And before we get to our final guest, let's hear again from our elected officials who are still with us, their final thoughts for the community. First, let's start with Mayor Hillary Sheevy. Mayor? Yeah, thank you so much. I think, like I said, we are going to get through this together. We're going to be stronger. We're going to be more resilient now more than ever. Um, you know, this is just something that uh, it's hard to wrap your head around. And I will tell you, you know, cities are really prepared for massive disasters like fires and floods. And this is just something so different because it's a public health crisis. But again, I can't stress enough to this entire community how proud I am of all of you for staying home. You've all been sending me pictures of you in your in your DIY masks. Some of you are even wearing uh, men's underwear over your faces. I don't care what it takes as long as you are protecting others and protecting yourself. Whatever it takes, we will get through this. And I just want to say thank you to our entire community. You have been tremendous, and I am so grateful. Thank you so much, Mayor Sheevy. Mayor Ron Smith, a few final thoughts from you. Well, first of all, thank you so much to all the great speakers. The information that you provided is very valuable. And like I said earlier, this is a different world. And I understand that many of us are used to celebrating Easter with our family and friends, but please, this Easter, let's celebrate via phone calls and Zoom meetings. Uh, let's all do this together to help flatten the curve. Stay home for Nevada. We will get through this, all of us together. Uh, you know, my, my wife and a group of women, it's a huge group, matter of fact, are making masks every day, uh, as many as they can, and they're getting them out to the different companies uh, at no charge. And uh, that's just part of the community. They, they wanted to do it. I didn't ask them to do it. So I, I'm very proud of my wife and, and the people that, that she's working with. So again, thank you for having me on this panel. Uh, great speakers, all, one and all. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mayor Smith. We appreciate it. And up next, Washoe County Commission Chair Bob Lucy, a few final thoughts. Yeah, thank you. I, I want to first thank and, and take a minute to thank all the healthcare community out there, the medical professionals, the, the first responders, um, the practitioners that are on the front lines day in and day out, really dealing with this and taking care of those patients that are that are critically needed in, in need, those that are hospitalized. They have really been the true warriors in this whole uh, fight against COVID-19. And it's, it's important that we don't take for granted their tireless effort and put that to waste by, by going out and starting to mingle. Even though it does, as Mary Smith said, it's Easter weekend, it's starting to, the weather's starting to change, it's gonna be nice out, don't take the chance. Don't, don't jeopardize the, the time that those individuals have put in and been on the front line. Really, please stay home for Nevada. Take the time to really make this important for those and don't don't sacrifice their their what they've given to our business community i want to tell you thank you for the sacrifices that you've made um, because on the front lines those individuals have had, had to close their shops um, as non-essential businesses 
please don't don't open your doors to the public yet. We're not ready for that. There's no reason for that. And for those essential businesses, please make sure that if you have employees that are sick, let them stay home. Don't don't let them come to work. That is something we need to continue to focus on. Um, you know, we need healthy workers in our community when we're ready to stand our community back up. And that means anybody who's sick needs to stay home, isolate, listen to what our panelists have said today. They're they're out there looking out for your best interest. You know, and if you've traveled, you have family members sick, please take this serious, you know, and stay home for Nevada. That is the biggest thing. You know, if you go out and get prescriptions or you have to go get groceries and you have to get those essential needs that you need for your home and your family right now, take the proper precautions. Wash your hands before you go out. You know, wear your masks. You know, I got my mask that my, my sister made for me and I wear it in and out of the office when I go out and when I'm in amongst, the, amongst people. This is important that we do continue to do social distancing, make sure that we're doing everything we can when we're outside of our home, if we have to go outside of our home toward those essential needs. So we're continuing to pull together as a community. I wanna thank everybody that's participated. You know, the regional support has been tremendous, but the communal support has been even better. I mean, you see really the streets are, are empty. Those stores are staying closed. And I wanna thank you for making sure that you've continued to follow those, those directives um, from your elected leaders, from our governor. Um, we really are a resilient community. We really do believe in being pioneers and being battle born. We've, we have fought many wars before and we're gonna continue to fight this one. This is just a faceless enemy that we can't see, but that doesn't mean that's something that we can't overcome. And so with that, I wanna make sure that you have taken the time to really enjoy your family, but do it at safe distance. Do it not at the jeopardy of everybody around you. And you know, if we will continue to move through this, the surge will come, um, but we will be prepared. We have a great staff. We have a great individuals that are out there working day in and day out. Um, if you see symptoms and you have symptoms, remember, call our health district, 328-2427. Uh, uh, share those symptoms with those individuals. If you wanna make sure that you keep up to all the, on the, all the information, and you know, go to covid19washoe.com. Make sure that you're getting all that through our joint information system. They're, they're trying to make sure that you get most up to date. Well, pay attention to the news. The news is covering this all the time. You're getting the most up to date information. Those are the types of things that are gonna get us through it. And be empathetic to your friends, your neighbors, um, your, your family. That is going to help. We need that empathy. That mental health is important at this time. It is going to be a trying time for all of us, but we need to do this as a, as a team and as a community. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you all so much for being here. What a fantastic panel of experts and elected officials. We thank you so much for your time. And before we go, we have one last community hero who's a guest with us today that we want to hear from. So with the CDC's new guidelines on wearing face coverings, many who have sewing skills in our community have put those skills to use to make masks. And one local seventh grader has dedicated hours to making masks for our healthcare professionals and for the elderly in our community. She also happens to be my daughter. Please welcome Isabella Ventitulo. Welcome, Bella. Hi. Hi. So tell us a little bit about how you got the idea and why you started making masks. Well, I heard about it and my um, dad brought the idea to me and I have sewing skills and I want to make sure that everyone stays safe in our community. So I put them to use and started making masks. That's fantastic. And how many masks have you made so far? Over 20. That's great. So tell us about what's been the best part about making masks for you. Knowing that everyone in our community will stay safe and knowing that everyone, uh, especially health care workers and elderly, will be safe wearing masks. That's fantastic. Thank you so much. I don't know if we can get a quick shot of everybody wearing their masks proudly, but it is fantastic seeing all of our experts and our local um, officials all wearing masks. I see Dr. Fry, Dr. Zerzinski, Dr. Anderson, Commissioner Lucy, Adam Hines. Thank you so much for wearing your mask. And Bella Ventitulo, she's wearing her mask. So thank you all so much. We so appreciate your time to join us today and to answer some of your questions. You've submitted them to us on our website, covid19washoe.com, and this is just the first of a series of town hall events for the month of April. We'll be tackling other issues like public safety and business issues in our community. So keep the questions coming on our website. Again, that's covid19washoe.com. And until the next one, I'm Amy Ventitulo. We'll see you at the next virtual town hall event.